Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, our next speaker, Heather, is going to talk about how important it is to care, take care of software engineers, to feed them, nurture them, and you know, make sure they stay alive. So give a warm welcome to her. Thank you. Hello. Thanks for joining me. All right. How many of you here are at least a senior level of an engineer? Yes? Terrific. So code just flows from you, right? It just, it's in your dreams, it's in your, in your day. Every waking hour is code just flows from you. And you've done so well now that surely you could get more money and a bigger position, right? What happens when you're given that position and you have no leadership training at all? Hmm. I can help you out with that because that definitely happened to me. <laughs> So what we're going to talk about today is what it's like to change from being an individual contributor to leading a team and the skills that you kind of need. I'm not just going to tell you general things, though. What I like about this talk is that you're going to get to learn what it's like for different personality types because we're not all the same, right? So how do you manage different kinds of people at different levels in their career? Do you even remember what it was like when you got started? I remember. I remember very much that uh, just trying to get a Hello World app to work <laughs> felt like it was a monumental task. But once you got it, you felt like a wizard. That feeling, I try to remember whenever I'm working with somebody that is junior to me, that it doesn't take a large project for them to get excited about what the code can do. And of course, then you get thrown, after your one cool app that you made, into a team of other software engineers. So then you have to learn how to work with each other, unless you're in, you know, just have your own business. And what you thought was going to be glamorous just turned into a lot of firefighting. But eventually, you become the master. You're feeling pretty good, feeling pretty smart. But just remember that success is a very lousy teacher. It seduces smart people into thinking that they can't lose. But congratulations to you, because you have now been seen as the most senior person that should definitely lead the team. You wanted more money, you got it, you got a title, and you're ready to go. Do you have everything you need? Hmm. You have to remember that people don't just follow you because you have a title. People follow you if they believe in what your vision is. That was a difficult thing for several of the people in my life to have learned. I've had great leaders, I've had terrible leaders, but mostly I had leaders who weren't sure what their role was in leading the team. There's the, the role that your company tells you that you do, and there's a role that you actually do. We're gonna do the latter, okay? The good news is, is that leadership is a muscle and you can build it. When I was starting my gym journey, I was a lot heavier than I am today and I have lots more to go. I, I first went in with my trainer and I said, okay, I'm ready to get started lifting weights. So we started that and I went ahead and started lifting till failure. I felt weak every day. So eventually I kind of got discouraged and I approached my trainer saying, I don't really think this working out thing is for me because I don't feel like I'm getting stronger. But what he did for me is that he took me back into the weight room and said, okay, I want you to go ahead and lift this now. He didn't show me what the weight was. He just asked me to lift it. And that didn't feel so bad. So what had happened is that over the months that I had been there, he just always would continuously, without letting me know, increment the weight that I was lifting. So it felt like I was never getting stronger because I was always failing at some point in time. But then he took off the weight that he had added since the beginning, and it didn't really feel as bad. This is what happens to you when you blindly go into the fire and become the manager of the team or the lead, right? Is that once you learn how to do something, there's always another fire to put out. There's always another new thing that you don't know very well. And so it can feel like you're failing the whole time, but really you're actually building that muscle behind the scenes. This is the one moment that I get to tell you that yes, while you have a responsibility to your team to improve, you also need to look backwards at where you started as a leader and acknowledge how far you've come. 
This is a great question. Um, I actually did a poll, um, probably at least 5,000 people, of like, what do you actually want from a developer leader? Not, you know, the company CEO. What do you want from a dev leader? They want good leaders that make them feel safe. Now, this is a difficult word for me to use because it probably doesn't mean what you think it means. It has more to do with being safe to fail. I don't want a leader that's going to judge me every two seconds because I tried something new or different. Um, because I, then I don't want to try. I'm going to spend a lot of time fretting and really deep diving before I'll even volunteer for anything. So this is the first thing that came up with multiple different responses, is they wanted to feel like they had a leader that believes that they could do something. But they also want somebody that has a higher vision and purpose for what it is you're doing. This is interesting because I've worked primarily in enterprise software and I don't necessarily believe in like working at a bank is like my higher vision and purpose, um, but it's necessary. So how do, you, how do you set something like that? These are just food for thought. Sometimes it can be maybe setting the goal to be really clean code. It could be the vision could be um, making sure everything's componentized and constant learning. You can set these things outside of the actual product that you are working on. They also wanted a leader that could be flexible and empathetic during personal challenges. This came up a lot because this poll was done right at, during the beginning of the pandemic, right? So a lot of people were struggling with how to balance their personal life, their family, their health. And it's important here that even if you don't personally feel for that person, that you at least give them the consideration and thought to give them time to work out what they need. So here's the fun part, the TED Talk part, right? I like you know, easy to, easy to remember words. So I've discovered from that poll that mostly devs want a leader that will listen, respect, encourage, recognize, and empower them to do their job. I used to say, I want a leader that gets out of my way. <laughs> Turns out I need a little bit more than a leader who just gets out of my way. A leader doesn't need to have the first word, the last word, or even most of the words. This is hard for some of us who like to talk a lot. Um, the state of a team will often be made very clear to you when you listen and digest what each of your devs have to say and not necessarily just jump to take action on it. Listening is an underutilized skill with leadership. And there's a difference between hearing somebody and letting them talk and processing what they said. Do you agree? I have felt heard but not understood many times, many times. So this is, again, a muscle that you can grow. Always let the employee go first in like a one-on-one -on -one meeting. And after processing what they said, if an action is required, then do it last, okay? Demonstrate active listening by repeating what you heard so that they actually have an opportunity to correct what it is you, you heard. You'll have differences and that's totally okay. In fact, it's pretty awesome. So you have to start respecting those differences instead of the temptation to tell them that they're wrong. This was difficult for me, especially since I have a very outgoing personality and not all of my devs did have that. And so I don't always want to tell them to be something that they're not naturally. The reason the developer thinks the way they think and do what they do, you have to think about their why, why they choose to behave and to bring the part of themselves to the team in the manner that they do. So if you start respecting with what they bring to the table, it's a lot easier to work through issues. Not everybody is a natural born cheerleader. Huh. You don't have to be a, a cheerleader. Did you know that? You don't have to be like, yeah, my team is awesome. Those are fun people. But that's not necessarily what I'm going, going for here. Remember, this is a muscle that you're building, yeah? Being a successful encourager just means believing in the ability that the developer has to overcome, especially when they don't believe it themselves. I have been guilty of that in my past. You have to see the potential in the person, even if you didn't hire them, especially actually if you didn't hire them. See if you can see the potential of what they could do. 
And you can talk to them about it, but not hold them accountable for it, saying, I believe that you could do these things, but don't put the pressure on to the point where they feel that they can't be safe to fail in it. Do you know that ranked higher importance in the list of things that an employee needs to be successful? Employees in every field are completely starved of recognition. And it depends culturally on where you're from. Uh, I'm from the States, and so sometimes we're really good about recognition. Sometimes it doesn't matter. I live in the center, and it's very traditional. And so there isn't a lot of encouragement naturally happening in my area. But recognition costs you nothing. It costs your company absolutely nothing. Just recognizing that somebody did something, and it doesn't need to be large. In fact, most people who decide whether they're going to stay at a company or not comes down to whether or not you, their leader told them that they get a, did a good job at some point during the year, not even during the month, during the quarter. I don't want to work somewhere that doesn't value what I'm doing. Do you think that's fair? So this is an easy win for you. It's harder if they're not producing, though, right? So let's say you've got a team, and there are various levels of productive. But you've got that one dev that just can't seem to deliver stuff on time or can't seem to get the code right, spends a lot of time in pull requests with the rest of the team, seems like it's a bit of a drag on the forward motion that you're trying to get to. How do you recognize that they have value? Hmm. I bet if you put your hat on a little differently, you could find something. And what I've discovered is that that person who doesn't seem to be keeping up with the rest of the team, if you can find something to recognize that they did well, uh, that's often all they need to relax and listen and apply what they need to do to improve. Remember, feeling safe to fail. This, the only time this kind of comes into a little bit of an issue is if they truly don't like what they do and they, they don't really want to do it. That's a different, that's a, that's a fit problem, but that doesn't mean you can't recognize what they bring to the table anyway. Delegation is really key here. <laughs> so I'm somebody who likes to do everything myself. That's why I got into tech. Um, I used to spend 10 years in hospitality working for other people, doing, helping them be successful. And I just really didn't enjoy it as much as actually killing a bug that was in a program. But I didn't want to delegate once I became a leader. <laughs> I wanted to keep all that power. I especially didn't want to give up my ability to code on the project. Because I wanted to be highly technical the whole time. I've worked with leaders that do both. There isn't necessarily a right answer. It depends on your company and what you're working on. Um, but you can be a coding leader. You can be a leader that holds all the meetings at bay so your devs are not drowning in the meeting invitations. Both of those are very good. Leadership is not about whether or not you're also an individual contributor, because that's great that you can be, but mostly your devs are looking to you for the leadership role, not necessarily the contributor role. So many people need co uh, continuous reminders that they have permission without you to go and make a decision. If you are somebody like me who is a control freak, then maybe that's more difficult for you. <laughs> you. To empower your team to make decisions means you trust them. What if you don't trust them, though? I mean, that's difficult. It sounds like you have a problem, not them. It sounds like you need to figure out why you don't trust each member or collectively your team to make suggestions about the right things or to be able to go do something. They shouldn't ha you should not be the bottleneck because if you go on vacation, they can't actually get anything done while you're there. So empower your team that, to instill confidence in them that they can go and make a decision about adding another core to the host provider, or et cetera. Make sure that you delegate a little bit of the decision making out. It also will help grow a leader behind you just in case you decide you want to retire one day. You have, a le you have leaders who are coming up right behind you that you've been training. Now we're going to talk about how to take care of the levels of developers that you have. So let's talk about the junior developers. <laughs> Yay. Basically, for your junior devs, I know it's been a long time and you don't remember what it's like to be junior, so I'm going to let you know. Show them how first. 
by demonstrating the task for them and staying nearby to guide as they learn. But let them make mistakes and remind them that it's okay that it happens, and you have to encourage them to get up and try it again, even though it'd be a lot quicker for you to do it for them. This is a temptation because, again, you are an amazing coder, developer. You know exactly how to get this done, but that's not the point. If you wanted to be a, an individual contributor, you should have stayed in that role. This is about how to manage other people. This is the biggest shift I see whenever somebody's promoted from being a senior level dev into a lead, is that they just don't want to take over and code for people. <laughs> Please do not do this. If you have any difficulty with this, then you should talk to your higher ups about giving your team more time or breaking down the tasks a little bit farther. But you should not count yourself as a contributor at this point in your career. This is a fundamentally different career shift you've now made. Congratulations. You have a different job now. So let's talk about the mid-level developers, the ones who are dangerous enough to get lots of things done but still don't know everything, right? It's important that you support coworker pairing at the mid-level because they now contribute more and more to projects with consistent results. And you need to generate confidence in your mid-level developers by encouraging them to vocalize ideas and ask them what they think before you ask what your senior developers think. This is an easy win for you because everybody still gets to tell you what they think about what you should do for a project, but you don't call on the experienced people. This forces them to stretch and to think about what they would do and why. Getting a developer to think about why they would do what they do is a multi-year process. So this is your opportunity. Again, it costs you nothing to just ask your less senior people all the way up to your senior. So what do you do? You have, maybe you have senior developers that are better than you were when you were like the lead coder, right? How do you take care of them? Well, most people that are at this level would like uh, time. They would like to be allowed time to experiment and be given autonomous tasks and maybe ask them to bring some new ideas to the rest of your team specifically about teaching concepts that they've, the team has never worked with before and showcasing new research for maybe how you would approach it. This is really fun for your senior devs to be able to do because they've already mastered all the boring stuff. This is the part where they get to really stretch their wings a little bit and do something that actually keeps them interested. There's a tendency, once you get to a senior level, to get bored very quickly, and this is a good way to keep them engaged. So now let's talk about personality types, okay? Here's a fun fact, I am an introvert. I had to learn how to present in front of you all. This is not natural for me, but I figured if I showed you what it was like for myself to have been encouraged by my leaders properly, that maybe when you run into an introvert in your group, which is probably a lot of you, <laughs> you'll know what to do. We're gonna go through each of the personality types so that regardless of level, you'll be able to address them as the person that they are. Okay, so how do you feed an introvert? Introverts need a lot less team time than you think. I find it very overwhelming to do pair programming for eight hours a day, five days a week. That's a lot because energetically, I need to go just be, myself in my, be by myself in my room and put my headphones on. That's why I got into coding, so I could get away from people and not have to deal with them more, you know? <laughs> but that's my personality type, right? I, I can do things for a while, and then I, like my energy is gone, and I, and I don't get it from, I don't get a lot of energy from other people. I have to save it up and then give it to you. Introverts are a little different, so being respectful of what it means to constantly engage them is important. This, this personality type is the reason you shouldn't have a bunch of meetings all day because that means they have to talk to people all day, you know? This is just something easy, simple, that you can keep in mind for somebody who has this personality type. But then we have lots of extroverts. Many of the speakers you've seen today are extroverts because I really love like getting up on the stage. So how do you feed that personality? Well, usually an extrovert needs to be given a reason to talk in front of people. <laughs> This is a great one. This personality type is really good for like um, giving different tasks to organize or um, 
educate, depending on the level. If they're not as senior, you can give an extroverted personality somebody who means really well and wants to, wants to really engage, but they don't have all the skill sets yet. You can give them the task of maybe, like, let's see, like, I don't know if you guys do a lot of agile work here, but in your st the concept of a stand-up is that everybody reports what they've done through the week, through the day. If you give them the task of calling on people and kind of gathering that information, then they are actively engaging with others, and that's something that usually lights them up inside. Oh, we could love a good optimist, don't we? There are these fun people that just never wake up on the wrong side of the bed and always seem to have been on coffee or something. <laughs> They're always, it doesn't matter what has crashed, it doesn't matter what's on fire, it doesn't matter that the database was deleted by accident. They are just optimistic, it's all gonna work out fine. And there's part of you that's like, that's really annoying. I don't really. <laughs> but let me tell you what, when you're down on working on a project, that is a deadline, you're probably gonna miss it. Your optimist will come in and help your team morale as a whole tremendously. Because it only takes one person saying, I think it's gonna be all right. A good example of this is, at least in my own country, we didn't have a leader at the time who told our people that it was gonna be okay. So the leader across the ocean from us sent us all a video that said, you know, we've seen your country go through stuff before, don't worry, you're gonna be fine. And sometimes that optimistic attitude is all that it takes for people to have faith that maybe they can pull through as a team and individually. So embrace your optimists. What they need to be given is hope. They need to be shown that, that even though things are dire at the moment, you need to give them something to hold on to that, so that they can also reverberate it out to the rest of the team. Then there's the rest of us who are pessimists <laughs> about the situation, right? So how do you deal with a pessimist, especially if you are also one? There's a tendency of mm, the, the attraction of like to like. Remember, you were a coder, and so now you're a leader, and you tend to um, probably bond a little closer with somebody who's more like you than the rest of the team's personality. So if you're a pessimist and then you became a leader, you're probably gonna gravitate towards complaining all the time with the rest of the pessimists on your team. <laughs> it's not actually a very good idea in your situation, but how do you still acknowledge what the pessimist brings to the table? What I love about this role, although I am not a pessimist, most of the people I've worked with are. How do you make them feel like they're in the right team? How do you make them feel like that? What the pessimist brings to the table is reality. It's great that you want to land a rocket backwards. That sounds so fun. But what happens when it like falls over into the ocean? What happens about this? They're the ones who give you the edge cases. The, when you have your blinders on and you're just so excited about moving everything to Node.js. Like what, they're the people who give you the dose of reality and you need that reality check. So allow the pessimist to speak their piece about the situation or better yet, call on them actively and say, okay, blind spots, pessimist, give me what the blind spots are for this project. And then they will feel like they're valued and they're not just a downer, right? That they're valued for why they feel a little trepidation about the situation. So how do you feed somebody who's sensitive? Ooh. This was hard for me. I, I mean, I'm an introvert, but I, I think I'm a nice person. But there are just people that it doesn't matter what you say, they're just very offended or they just have a really bad day all the time. Like, how do you deal with that sensitive developer? <laughs> and feed them as well. Ah. Do you have any ideas? Mm -mm. I thought, don't talk to them. That sounds like a, a good answer for me. Uh, but in that case, I just don't want to offend them. So then I stopped letting them in be involved with team stuff. I started isolating them without realizing it because I just didn't want to start a problem. This also is, is an issue between genders or races, is that you're like, oh, that person seems like they're really sensitive about that topic. I don't just gonna walk backwards and away from politics now and not talk to them about that, you know? That's not the right answer. Somebody who's sensitive often has a lot of empathy and insight as to how the team is feeling when you have no idea. They're the ones who feel everybody else around them. Um, they're usually very perceptive about pattern changes in behavior. They're the ones who are gonna tell you that the team is disconnecting from you because you're doing something wrong. 
they have a little bit more insight as to how the whole team feels. So utilize them often and saying, how do you feel? But also, how do you think the team is feeling? Number one, that pulls them out of themselves and their own emotions and allows them to feel for the rest of the team. And two, it shows them that you value what it is they feel. But we've all got a bold person on the team now and then, right? That's just really excited to tell everybody about the latest and greatest technology that they learned overnight. Right? How do you feed somebody who's bold, even if you're not a bold person? You got to give them a reason to get on a stage. Doesn't matter what kind it is. It can be in front of your team. It can be in front of, this is a good sacrificial lamb to give to your corporate over overlords saying, hey, why don't you go show them what it is we built? Go do a demo. Sounds good. I believe in you. Send your bold person. They will love it. They will feel really important and they will love it. So what, what, let's talk about somebody who is intellectually really very bright and they're, they're a thinker. How do you deal with somebody like that and not bore, be, bore them, especially if they're a lower level developer with mundane tasks? How do you do with that? I like bringing people who are bright into the high level conversations saying, hey, this is our or why. This is why we're building this, or this is why a company is building this. Um, and let them think about what things look like the next version or the version after that. They're usually the most creative people in your team. But then the last one I kind of wanted to discuss with you is actually not a personality type. Any one of us could get to the point where we're a little bit down about what's going on in our life and we can't just seem to get out of it. What I want to... Mm, guide you on is that somebody who's downhearted, this could be a temporary thing. This could be a situation where you just have a lot going on in your life. What a leader needs to do for somebody like this is just show support. Do not dig that much. You are not a psychologist, nor should you pretend to be that role on your team. Just say, if you need some time, we'll give you time and mean that. We'll give you time if you need to figure things out. Just communicate with us and and go from there. If, if need be, and you feel like there are situations that are overwhelming to you, and you don't want to do the wrong thing, bring in your HR person and just say, hey, how do I allow this person to have a little bit more time and support? That's your role. Support, but do not dig. Everybody's personal life has a lot going on in it, right? All I, we really want from our leaders is just a little bit of understanding. So how do you deal with somebody who's disconnected? There's a fantastic... Um, concept going around, at least in the, the western part of the, the world, called quiet quitting. Has anybody heard of this before? Nobody? Great. I get to bring it to you. So the concept of a quiet quitter is somebody that works a nine-to-five job and doesn't stay one minute after five and is not actively volunteering to do things. Sounds like a normal job, right? But at least in the West here, we want you to work 80 hours a week with lots of enthusiasm. So it feels like you're quitting your job while not quitting your job. It's ridiculous. I would call it just somebody who's disconnected because they're not really interested in what it is you're building or you as a leader or whatever it is. They just kind of want to do their job and then walk away. I would argue that it's not your job to motivate them. If they're engaged, great. If they're not, that's okay. Do you think we still need developers that help hold up the internet? Yes, I would like the internet to continue. So the advice I give you is when somebody's disconnected, do not judge them because they're not as happy-go-lucky as another person on the team. They probably are still providing value. They're just maybe not as engaged. So I would say respect their choice to have more of a work-life balance, more disconnected presence. So how do you treat your team as a whole? Allow your developers to do their jobs. <laughs> Please, don't code for them. Handle all the non-development work needs, you know, the stuff you really love, like going into 12 meetings a day. Be moderately responsive and reachable. Obviously, if you're on vacation, this is different. Uh, but I would still argue to hand out like your phone number to the right person if things are dire. Oh, this is a big one. Do not cancel meetings with each person on your one-on-ones -on without rescheduling immediately. If you're gonna, if you're gonna change, basically in your mind, you might be just moving it from this state to that day. Don't just cancel and then come back to it. They will feel abandoned like you don't care. It's an easy habit that you can build in. Emphasize quality code over quantity or velocity. This is difficult when you are having a lot of pressure from your management team trying to get things out the door. 
but that's almost always the wrong decision and you need to make sure that your team feels supported in pr producing quality code and not just a whole bunch of it. And try to avoid task switching, like giving them a bunch of projects at different times of the day where they have to kind of rev up their mind a little bit. And be the shield for your team when challenges arise. This is a big one. Um, if you let everything, that, the pressure that you're getting, roll down hell to the rest of your team, they're not going to feel like you're doing anything. They might as well just be getting all of that inundation directly from your manager. So do something to stop all of it from coming down and let them focus on what they do best. Trust your team's judgment. You may need to step in to make decisions and priority calls, but this will be based on the information that your team provided to you, or should be. If you get this right, you should have a good, autonomous, and self-directed team. So I want your takeaways to be to give away control and create opportunities for others to grow. Okay? Drive for autonomy, mastery, and purpose, and allow your team to fail. If you don't have a built-in structure at your company for handling when an employee doesn't do something right, sounds like you have a lack of a structure, or at least an incorrect structure. Teach others and emphasize that you are learning as well. This is a good easy out for both of you saying, hey, I became a manager after I was a coder, so I'm going to make mistakes. Let me know if there's something I'm, that you need differently from me. Instead of saying, tell me when I did something wrong. Nobody's going to do that for their boss. <laughs> tell, them, tell them, okay, if you need to be, um, I don't want to say handled, but if you need to have just a different kind of a working relationship, let me know and then we'll adjust because I'm imperfect and I'm also learning. And I'm, this last one's just for you. It's okay to not know everything about this job. You have to be honest about that. Because, you know, eventually you're going to get it, right? So keep, to keep your developers from quitting, allow them to code and don't code for them. Keep your developers happy by being a gate opener and not a gatekeeper. Don't be that bottleneck. Empower your people to do what they do best and stay curious. Thank you.